Welcome to the Grow Strong Leaders podcast. I'm your host, Meredith Bell, and I interview business leaders who are committed to their own growth and the development of everyone on their team. If you enjoy my podcast, be sure to subscribe and rate it on your favorite podcast platform. Thank you for joining me today. I'm your host, Meredith Bell, and I love introducing you to people who are committed to their own development and to helping others become the best version of themselves. My guest today does that in so many remarkable ways. I'm really thrilled to have back as my guest, David Wood. David, welcome back. Meredith Bell, thank you. Well, I must um, encourage all of my listeners, if you are recent to my show, you must go back and listen to episode number 100. It is one of my favorite conversations. David and I had a really in-depth conversation about openness and honesty and, and so many important topics. And today we're really going to build on that because we're talking about his new book called The Mouse in the Room, Because the Elephant Isn't Alone. And we're at this time in our world when we need more vulnerability and transparency and connection. And David's experiences throughout his career make him the ideal person to teach us how to do that. He actually was an actuary, and then he built the world's largest coaching business where he coached thousands of hours in 12 countries around the world, and he's advised many, many business leaders and business owners over the years. So the mouse in the room actually is a very powerful guide to Fonz to fostering more connection, influence, and understanding with the people who matter to you, both at work and at home. Such a timely topic, David. So you are one of these people who has explored so many different areas throughout your career. And one of the things I love about you is this interest you have in pursuing different topics. And an underlying theme of all of that to me has been how to connect with people in a meaningful way that's not superficial, that allows us to be open and honest. So I'd like to start out with you just telling us briefly about your decision to write this book. What were you seeing that caused you to say, this message needs to get out there? Well, thank you for the question. I... I've been training for 25 years in communication, personal growth, leadership. And I came to Boulder and I discovered this new branch for me of communication called authentic relating. And it was amazing. It was like there were missing pieces. Like when you say something to someone, checking for impact. How is it for you to hear that? What's happening for you? going deeper into sharing your own experience. We would sit in circles and all we were allowed to share is our experience right now. No story about a year ago, not what I want tomorrow, but this moment I'm feeling nervous sitting in the group and I notice I want to connect. I notice I feel drawn towards you and I'm worried that I'm going to say the wrong thing and you guys aren't going to like me. Like we had to drill down into our experience. And I'm like, this is, this is incredible. This is a missing piece. And then we started teaching this in, in prisons uh, with the Realness Project here in Colorado. And then one day in one of the courses, a woman said, you've just got to name the thing. And we're like, what do you mean? You've got to name the thing, the thing. You've just got to name the thing. We're like, what are you talking about? She said, whatever's there in the room, whatever's there between you, whatever's happening, it might be disappointment. You know, maybe you felt betrayed by something they did. Maybe you've got a desire that's unexpressed. Maybe your body's experiencing pain and that's kind of getting in the way. Whatever the thing is, you just have to name it. You don't have to fix it. You don't have to do anything with it, but you have to name it. And I thought... She's so right. There's power in naming what's happening, even if we just name it for ourselves. Oh, this is happening and I don't like it. 
this is happening and I feel really sad about it. And I, and I said that day, that's a book. Name that thing. That was, that's a book. Name that thing. And then I thought, um, you know, over, over the, a year went by, two years went by. She didn't seem interested in writing a book about it. And so I said, what do we have in our culture that best reflects this or that's the closest thing to it? And I thought the elephant in the room. We all, we all know about it. You see the elephant. I see the elephant. No one's saying anything. It's weird. Well, I'm here to say, yes, we should address the elephant in the room. And we, sh- we could have called the book that. But many animals in the room are much more subtle. Maybe you don't see it. And it's just my experience. Maybe I'm wondering if you see it. Let's suppose I'm late, which I was today. I think I was two minutes late to this call. If I, I, I didn't say anything, but there's a part of me thinking, is Meredith upset? I'm committed to being on time. I'm a little embarrassed that I'm late. These are mice. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on for you, but these are my mice. And the book is designed to help us discover our mice. This is what's actually going on with me right now. And, and should I share it? Because we've been conditioned not to. And then how do I artfully name it in a way that's going to be Mm well-received? And when we do that, life gets better, business gets better, we make more money, we're happier, we're more confident, we have more connection, and we're a better leader that people actually want to follow. Mm -hmm. That's, That's such a remarkable story there, just to look at the the evolution of your thinking there. I love where that came from. You talk about naming the mouse and in your book, you actually have eight. Are there, is it possible there are more than that or, or what caused you to settle in on those eight that you describe? Yeah, of course there could be more than that. You know, we could have picked four, um, but you know, as we picked four, we're like, Oh, Oh, this other one's so good. And it really, you know, it's just a way for us to get a handle on some of our mice and to look a little deeper. So if we just said mice, we'd be like, oh, I don't know what I've got. But if you go through the list of mice, you can say, oh, do I have a desire mouse here? Yeah, there's a desire here. Do I have a toleration mouse? Yeah, I don't like this. It's a way of help. Brene Brown says that, I think this is in Atlas of the Heart. She says that most people in the US can identify only three emotions. Three. And she's suggesting there are 87. And that, I think that's accurate. That's how I grew up. I just didn't know what was going on. If I was really sad, I knew that. If I was really happy, I knew that. If I was feeling afraid, Maybe I knew that I I just felt stressed, but I didn't really couldn't even get down into it what it is. So same with the with the mice. Yeah, you could have 50, but we pick the eight most important ones to help you go looking and go, oh, what you know what? I got a confession mouse on my hands. And then that allows you to go to your partner or your child or your boss or your boardroom. And you, you may say, hey, I have a confession mouse on my hands. If, you're, if they know the lingo, ideally they've read the book too. But if they haven't, you might just say, hey, I, I want to admit something to you. I, I've, got, I've got something that I'd like to come clean about. And here's why. Well, now you're off to the races. So we've categorized them just to make it easier to identify and to communicate, particularly when other people have also read the book. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to go into all eight of them because I don't want to be superficial about it, but I would love for you to. And I'm not going to reveal all eight. You got of to get course the not. The eight. Of course not. But let's pick one or two that probably universally people would identify with. So we yep. bring it to life and make it real. Give us one of them. And what does that look like? Yeah. Well, I, I can talk about the three I've brought up already. So toleration mouse. We put up with a lot of stuff and sometimes we don't even know it. What we might know is, oh, I feel frustrated. 
You might not even know that. You might just be snapping at somebody. But then if you stop and look, oh, I'm frustrated. All right. What don't I want? I don't want those socks all over the floor. I don't want my boss to pat me on the head. I don't want, you know, whatever. That's a toleration mouse. Okay, great. And in the 3D worksheet, which is a free download, once you get the book, we're like, this is the process. Here's the worksheet to download. Uh, and by the time this is released, you might be able to get the worksheet at mouseintheroom.com. Uh, but you identify, okay, I got these toleration mice. In fact, in my relationship, I've got 12 toleration mice. You might be like, oh, I got this, 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 this. So just start to become aware of the things that you are tolerating. Then if that's what you're tolerating, you might next go, what are my desire mice? What do I want? Okay, I want to be acknowledged for the work I do, and I'd like to be acknowledged at least once a week for that. I'd like to hear from my partner what they love about being in this relationship. I want, uh, <laughs> I'm having lunch with a producer today. Uh, I'd like the producer to give me some advice on my acting career, maybe some guidance, maybe let me shadow him on his next film shoot. I got some desires, right? It's wonderful to, to, to discover those. We've often squashed them down because it's not okay to want, particularly for women in our culture. Uh, women, I understand, were taught more than men. Just, just, just don't be too loud. Be, be seen and not heard. A attract a partner and you'll be fine. Um, sometimes it's, it's like, oh, I couldn't want too much. No, des your desires are a gift to the world. So get clear on your tolera toleration mice. Then you might find your desire mice. Now you're, you're halfway there to communicating with someone else because you can say, hey, can we talk for, for a bit? I've, I've realized a whole bunch of stuff I've been, that's been going on for me and I just want to clear it. Uh, and I want to be seen and more known to you uh, and express myself. So can, can we we'll talk for five or 10 minutes? Oh, now's not a good time. How's this afternoon at two o'clock? All right, you got it. It's a date. And then you come and you bring it using the, the 3D process in the book. Mm -hmm. Those are two great mice because I think too often we do tolerate things. We're not even conscious that we're tolerating them. We're, it, like you say, we're frustrated or we have this slight irritation and then we might lash out or mild or be sarcastic or in some way express what's going on without the awareness of it. And I think that's such a key to what you're describing here, this raising our level of awareness. Can you talk a little bit about this 3D process? What, what's involved in going through and becoming more aware and doing something about these? Yeah, great. And, and first, I think I want to sell the sizzle a little bit about why it matters. Because I think one of the reasons we don't share our mice more freely is we don't know what they are. So we don't have the awareness. We, we just know I don't like that. I once had a podcast host um, not show up and I had offered him a coaching session as a gift and he didn't show. And I, I oriented my day around it. And I wrote to him and said, what happened? He said, oh, my bad. Um, sorry about that. I've re used your booking link to rebook for the next following week. I did not like that. I didn't know why. I just knew I don't want to have this session with him. So, and I'll use that as an example in the 3D process. The first thing is we don't even know what's happening. I just don't want to do the session with him. So the simple thing, we'll just jump to, I'm just going to tell him I don't have time. Right? How common would that be? I just tell him I don't have time, close him off, probably not talk to him again. Um, so one reason is we're not aware of what's happening, so we, we can't communicate it. The second reason is we don't have the 3D process. So if we just go and say, hey, I'm, I'm feeling annoyed that you 
that you didn't show up and I'm feeling annoyed that you booked without asking me and just assuming that I'm going to do it. That may not go very well. So this 3D process is the answer to both of those problems. It will help you find what your mice are. It will help you decide if it should be named because not all mice should be named 10 times more than you're naming right now should be named, but not all of them will help you decide. And then how to say it in a way that the person's going to receive it. So here are the three Ds. First D, discover. <clears throat> Go through the worksheet, work out what you're feeling, what you're wanting. If you have a request, it'll help you get clear on that. Second D, decide. How important is this relationship? What's the upside of, of naming these mice? What could happen? What, what good thing could come of it? That's so important. The mind will tell you all the bad things, <clears throat> which you'll also do in the worksheet. Well, the worst thing, I, the person could get offended. They could yell at me. I might feel awkward. Uh, I, I could get fired. My partner might leave me or give me the cold shoulder for a while. We just get really up close and personal about what's the upside, what's the downside. Then you can weigh them up and say, you know what? I'm willing to accept those consequences or I'm not. I'm not willing. I'm not going to name the mouse. I am willing because I can see the upside and I want practice in being me. I want to be seen and known. So you, you, let's suppose you decide you're going to do it. The third step, disarm or in American disarm. Disarm the person so that they, so that they, <laughs> I need to practice my accent for, for acting class, but it's a little weird to just switch between US and, and Australian. So disarm the person, uh, which involves, uh, and I'll, you know, I'll give a preview of a couple of things, getting consent. Don't just dump it on them. Hey, can I talk about X and here's why? I'd like to talk about it. And here's why I was hesitant to, to bring it up. That's often going to show some vulnerability. It's going to show your positive intent. And, and the person gets to say yes or no. And if they say, yeah, I got, I got 10 minutes, shoot. They're in a much better frame of mind than if you just came in and just started launching into whatever's going on. And we'll, get, we'll coach you in the, in the book about having ownership language. So you're just talking about your world and your experience and not making declarations about what they did and what they think and how the universe is. That's arguable. But if you talk about your experience, that's inarguable. So there's lots of ninja tips, but you've got the bones of the 3D process to naming a mouse. Dis discover, decide, and disarm. And the worksheet will make it way easier because it's like a paint by numbers. You fill it in and then you can even have that with you. I, I'm serious. You can have that worksheet with you when you go and name the mouse. You can say, I really wanted to uh, be as clear as possible. So I wrote down some notes about it. And if you see me looking down this, I'm, I'm trying to keep track of it because it's not, it's not all clear in my head. You can, you can do that. The person's like, oh, okay. All right, this is a bit edgy for you. What, what do you got? Mm -hmm. sure. You know, so much packed in there that I want to reflect on for a moment because I think we can get into this reaction mode. Something happens, we're triggered, and then boom, we, we feel like we need to say something. Just recognizing that there's this 3D process to take the time to stop and think about how do I feel about what happened? Do I want to discuss it? Weighing the potential impact. And then I love the disarming part. This uh, Because what you're really doing is helping that person. Well, you're empowering them, really. Giving them the opportunity to say yes or no. And I think taking that sheet in helps them see you've really given this some thought. You know, this isn't just some reactionary uh, dump on me kind of conversation, you really want, you care about the relationship. That to me is what it's conveying. Yeah, that's, that's true. And this is one of the reasons in the sheet that we ask, what is the upside? 
What's your positive intent? Now, often we don't even know. All it might start with is I don't like this. I'm not happy. I'm not sleeping well. I'm a bit stressed. Or you catch yourself complaining to somebody. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that, that, you know, I don't like how that goes or the teaching teacher keeps going late. It's already 11 o'clock at night and the teacher's going over 10 or 15 minutes. There's a complaint. And as my friend Kenja Kunyov says, a desire, a complaint is a lazy desire. Mm. So we, we have in the book how to set your mouse detectors, how to work out, wait, is there a mouse going on here? And it might just be, I don't really like it. I don't like what's happening. But when you get down into it in the book, that question of what's your positive intent? Well, your positive intent might be to have a better working relationship or it might be just for you. It might be you want to clear the air so you can let go of this and and move on because it's been bothering you. But ideally, you'll find a positive intent that includes the other person. I'm sharing this with the team because I think we can be more productive and have more fun in our meetings. And I want to find out if you guys agree, right? That's positive intent. Now they know where you're coming from that includes them. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you do what one of my friends said to me once, she sent me a text, I'm pissed. We need to talk. <laughs> now, come on. We've all done it at some point. Um, that just doesn't set the person up well. So these are ninja moves. It'll change your life. You'll be, instead of sharing, naming 10% of your mice, which is, which I, estimate is happening for most humans, you start naming maybe 80% of your mice. You still keep some of them as private or it's just not, it's not really needed. It's not going to have a, a, a real positive impact on the world. Like if you, if you got a friend has got a messy house and each time you see it, you don't, you don't even want to go there. Um, maybe you decide friend doesn't need that from me, doesn't need my judgment. Or maybe you decide, you know, this might be a contribution. Maybe, maybe they don't want to live like this and I'll, I'll see if they're open to a conversation. I don't know. I'm, that's kind of my style. But the point is not all mice have to be named, but we want to go from 10 or 20% of mice being named right now to 80%. That's what's going to change your company, your life and the world. In fact, we'll get, you probably can't read this quote on the book behind me, but I just, I'm so grateful to Jack Canfield. Um, what we're putting on the cover is a quote from Jack. This book will change your company, your life and the world. And it's all through the power of mouse naming. Mm-hmm. It, it's really true. I get that feeling just listening to you. Let's look at, so, you know, if only 10% of our mice are getting named, what's the downside? What's the price we're paying for not naming them? Oh, it's huge. It's huge. I, I'm having flashbacks now to being a kid in Australia and it wasn't natural or normal for my parents or anyone's parents at that time to say, how are you feeling? Yeah, we were going to go to the zoo. We're not going to go to the zoo now. How do you feel about that? No. No one ever asked me, so I never checked in. No, what am I feeling? What are you, what's going on in your body? Where do you feel it in your body? Oh, you're angry? That makes total sense. Say more about that. Do you want to hit some pillows? You know, that sucks that we're not going to the zoo now. You're right, that empathy, that didn't happen. So we shut it down and we just learned. If I say I'm disappointed or betrayed or angry or frustrated or whatever, or if I want too much, then uh, I'll get in trouble. So the cost is that we are not known. We are not fully known to ourselves. We are not fully known to the people in our lives. And I feel sad about that. That creates a sense of loneliness, disconnection. It undermines our confidence because we're showing one thing to the world And then there's another thing going on. So we don't have that congruence. So we don't have confidence because there's no solid foundation. What if someone finds out? What if someone finds out? And this could be subconscious. It's not even a conscious thought. What if someone finds out that I'm I'm pissed 
or that I'm annoyed or that I actually don't think I can do a good job at this. Of course, you're going to going to lose confidence. And then for leaders, people won't want to follow you. They won't know why, and you won't know why, but it's because there's a lack of congruence. You're presenting something, but the things that are underneath it, it's like you're in a canoe and there's, there are currents and waves and whatever underneath the canoe, and you're just trying to pretend it's all smooth sailing, but they can feel it. If you've got time pressure and you're trying to wrap up the meeting and you don't name it, hey, I, I have another meeting in five minutes, so this might feel a bit quick, but let's, you, can we wrap it up in the next four minutes? Does that work? Okay, great. Thanks. Instead of just, okay, sorry, I need to, need to stop you there, Bill. What about this, Jenny? It's weird. And people won't even know why, but there's a lack of congruence. Mm -hmm. So the cost to not mouse naming is huge. And then because of that disconnection and lack of confidence, we look for other things to medicate, sugar, eating, overeating, video games, social media, alcohol, cannabis. You know, I speak for myself. I use a lot of crutches. Um, I think I already mentioned video games, TV, right? We go for these things because we're missing that raw connection and that experience of being truly seen for ourselves. I, I, Jack's not joking when he says this book will change your company, your life, and the world. This is the path. It's a path. There may be 20,000 other paths, but this is the most critical path that I've known, discovered, and it's why I've devoted my life <laughs> for the last two years and the next year to this message mm -hmm. of mouse in the room. Mm -hmm. Go looking for your mice in the room, and then artfully name them, you will change your relationships, your life, your company, and ultimately will change the world. I believe that's really true. And listening to you describe that, first of all, I get chills just thinking about the power of it. And also thinking about that desire mouse, I think, you know, one of the, you, you alluded to the fact that a lot of people have trouble getting in touch with that. And I think part of that, David, has to do with the, their, their sense of self, their, their self-worth. You know, am I worthy of wanting and having things? Part of it is, you know, what we're, what the messages we get. Uh, either spoken or unspoken. And so I'm curious about, as I think about the power of what you communicate in your book and the mindset somebody may bring to it about whether they're conscious of it or not, but underneath it's, I'm not really worthy of asking for what I want, for example, or I don't want to really tick people off. What would be some advice you would give to helping someone become maybe more open about being willing to become aware to name these mice? I love that you brought up self-esteem. Self-esteem, I didn't want to talk about for many, many years. I think a lot of people don't. We don't, ironically, we don't want to admit that we have self-esteem issues that we have doubt. I doubt myself quite often. Can I really do it? What if I'm, what, you know, at some level, I think I've always had, what if people say, ah, oh, you suck at this or you're, you're a fraud. I think all of us have it, but we don't want to admit it because it's, we think it's weak. It's weak to say, I have doubt. The thing is, People connect with you around your imperfections, mm -hmm. not your perfections. Vulnerability is the new strength. So I'm quite happy to get up on stage now after years of practice and say, I have doubt. I'm willing to say I deal with anxiety. I just moved to LA. I've had, I have a lot of stress. I'm having trouble um, sleeping and got a lot of fatigue 
I've taken on huge projects and it's a lot of fun. And my nervous system isn't always on board with the whole thing. It took years to learn how to name that and name that in a way that I'm not collapsing from it or bleeding from it or apologizing for it, like just naming it in dignity. This is how it is. Now, I think almost every, so many, I haven't done, I don't have a psychology degree. And in my experience of thousands of hours of coaching and in living 53 years on the planet, I've decided that a lot of what's happening comes back to something about self-worth. My coach just said to me, look, I'll, get, I'll give you, you know, three years of a psychology degree in a minute right now. I said, okay, great. You know, I'm listening. And he said, you know, we, we start with, I don't like what's happening and we're, we're against what's happening but then we make it mean something about us. Mm -hmm. So it all comes back to something about us. I should have done that better or I, maybe I don't deserve to have that or what are people going to think about me because of this? And it's all uh, subconscious. So if you think you don't have a self-esteem issue, great. Maybe you don't. Maybe you're just very grounded and connected and you're willing to express anything that you have some shame around embarrassment around, great, I want to know you. If there's any hiding, and I suggest for most humans there is, then great. Just find those parts of you that you're hiding and start practicing mouse naming with your kids. Maybe you won't be on the pedestal so much and you'd be more human with your kids about your frailties and your desires. Maybe at work, you'll have your team read this book as well so that everyone can start being more transparent and more revealed and you can actually be connected and care about each other. I once went to a, an authentic relating games night and I wanted to leave. I was tired and I just wanted to, to go home. And I said, one more exercise. And so I sat with this guy and the exercise was to complete this sentence stem. What I don't want you to know about me is within three minutes of listening to this guy with what he doesn't want me to know about him, I had tears in my eyes. My heart was fully open and I felt like this is my brother because I could relate to the thing that he didn't want me to know. And I was so impressed and respectful that he would be willing to name that and let me in. And the tiredness was gone. And I'm like, how can I generate this state all the time? And the answer is to take the risk of revealing. You take the risk. Now, sometimes it's going to be awkward. That's why the courage comes in. Sometimes it's going to be scary. I have named a mouse with my boss and risked being fired. Fortunately, I, I, I didn't. They said, you know, okay, this works for us. Let's, 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 uh, let's work together on this. I've risked losing a relationship because I confessed something that I'd done that broke an agreement. And she did break up with me. I had to earn her trust back. And that's how it should go if you've broken an agreement, that there's impact on the other person. They get to choose what they're going to do. And then either you're done or you earn it back and you recommit. I've confessed to a crime a, a couple of times. I tracked down the person involved and said it was me. I want to confess and I'm really sorry. How can I make it right? I could have been prosecuted. Now, I'm not saying you need to do all of these things. I've had 25 years of practice at it. What I'm saying is get the book, read the book, and there'll be exercises for you to start writing down your mice. Oh, I've got a mouse here. I've got a mouse here. I've got a mouse there. Well, that's a big mouse. That's a rodent of unusual size right there. That's a big mouse. Okay. And then go through the 3D worksheet and decide which ones you're going to name. You don't have to do all the huge, scary ones. You might pick some of the easier ones to start with. And then you might be like, you know, that big one, I'm going to live my life. 
it takes guts to live my life and I'm going to live my life. I'm going to name that mouse. I'm going to use the worksheet and I'm going to be expressed. And then I'll check for impact and then we'll go from there. That, like that, that in, lights me up so much. Just the idea that of someone doing that in the world. We watch movies about that because we want that experience of being revealed and being loved and accepted and having an impact, a real impact. We watch <laughs> movies for that experience. Now we can have that. We can have that with the person at the, at the checkout counter. Hey, I notice I'm, I'm actually admiring how you, how you did that. That's an appreciation mouse. There you go. Now you got four mice name, appreciation mouse. I love that one. And I encourage people to take a look at that. All right. I have one other question for you. So (laughs) let's say we have a group at work and uh, the leader is modeling this whole thing of naming mice, but now I'm on the receiving end of somebody naming one to me. Um, And so what suggestions do you have for someone who is, going to be listening to another person talk about their mouse. How do I receive that so that they feel heard, understood, and we connect more deeply and there isn't this potential for division? Great. So the short, the way I hear that is how can I listen better? Yeah. How can I listen? Often when people are sharing their mice, we skip over our mice. We don't even know what's going on inside us. We just jump straight to survival. Oh, I need to defend myself and, and bring in my position. Forget listening to them. Forget getting their experience. Oh, what was that like for you? Oh, you know, getting the impact on them. Forget just understanding everything, what they're feeling and how important this is to them and finding out what they want. We jump straight, if it's, uh, if it's got anything to do with us, we jump straight to a defense or, oh, yeah, I got a story like that too. We don't get people's world, which is part of why we're feeling so disconnected and isolated. So you can change that. And uh, in the book, we talk about emotional Aikido from the martial art of Aikido where you, you, you don't force and you don't push against. If someone's coming at you, you roll with it. You roll with it. Let them spend their energy. So first thing that you do, if someone's got a mouse is you've got to become aware of, oh, this person's got a mouse. This person's got something going on. I used to, when I was at a summer camp, they they would train us and say, just imagine putting a bandaid on their forehead to just let you know that person's got something that they want to share and might need help with. So you got to catch that. Otherwise you're into automatic or you're already into automatic. And then you go, Oh, sorry. I just started talking and you might have more to say. So step one, breathe. It'll put you more in your body, draw some energy around your head and allow you to be with this person. So first thing, breathe. And while you're breathing, there's more of a chance that you can actually listen. And then two two magic phrases. One, thank you. Is there more you'd like to say? Say say more about it. That's a magic, magic phrase. Thank you. Tell me more. Is there more? And then the next one, you know, once, once they feel like they've got it all out, can I say it back to you to make sure I got it? The label for that is reflection. Mm-hmm. It's a ninja, ninja tool. How often do you skip over that in your work? Someone said something. Maybe it really matters to them. Maybe they're passionate. Maybe they're emotional. Maybe they're annoyed. I don't know. I sound like Trump. Maybe they, I don't know. Um, what? <laughs> I just lost my train of thought right in the middle of that. And it was, I was rocking. 
Um, you were saying, oh, can I say it back to you and how people so rarely. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a missing piece. Step. It's, it's a missing piece. And I just realized I've got an interview in, in one minute. So maybe we can complete this at another time. But um, that's huge. Can I say it back and make sure I got it? Mm-hmm. And they might still be rolling and saying stuff You're like, oh, OK, I'll keep listening. But at some point, can I say it back? Even if they're really angry. They, they're likely to say, okay, and then you say it back to show that you got it and you heard it. Is there anything you want to correct or add to that? You want to get to a point where they say, no, you, you got it. That mm-hmm. it sounds like you really understand. Now there might be a time for, may I respond? May I respond? I got some thoughts. Uh, I do want to defend myself. I feel like I do want to defend myself, whatever it is. Now you might be able to name your mice. It's a game changer. That's great, David. Thank you. Uh, so real quick, let's wrap up by just having you say, how can people connect with you and get a copy of this wonderful book, Name That Mouse? Thank or you. Mouse in the Room, sorry. Yeah, I, I'd love you to get, get the book, read it and apply it. And if you want to help with a bestseller campaign, here's how to help. On June 13 at noon Pacific, Go and buy the book. In fact, we're going to have a 99 cent Kindle version for that hour, maybe for the day. I don't know. So buy 15 to 25 at 99 cents, and then you can go into the back end and gift those to your friends as it'll, and it'll load up in their Kindle. So it's really cool. Go to Mouse in the Room. We'll have a link to the Amazon book. We'll have uh, a list of the bonuses we're providing for people who buy one book. And if you've bought 50, uh, more than 10 or 15, we're going to have like, I'm planning on a $2,000 bonus. I really want to make some noise and get people mouse naming. So go to mouseintheroom.com, set your alarm for noon Pacific, because that's the best time and you'll get that Kindle price. And then if you really want to help, with a campaign, if you think mouse naming could change the world as I do, go back a day later. You don't do it straight away, but a day after you bought the books and leave her a, a five star review if you think it deserves it. Apparently, that's the way that the algorithm works that you get to make some noise and you get on the bestseller campaign. Mouse in the room. Dot com. And if you come after June 13th, that's totally fine too. Get the book, paperback, Kindle. And let me know the impact it has on your life and work. Thank you, David. Thank you for the wonderful work you're doing in the world. I so appreciate you. You're, you're phenomenal. Thank you. Meredith, always a pleasure to spend time with you. Thanks for tuning in to my podcast. Now head over to growstrongleaders.com and check out our two books, Connect With Your Team and peer coaching made simple. While you're there, download the free facilitator guide to find out how to implement our unique peer coaching system. Until next time, I'm Meredith Bell.